I think, I think what we've got is a huge problem in the, in the world. I think the planet will survive, but uh, the people on the planet, uh, I think their, their lives are in jeopardy. Human habitation on the planet is really threatened by two major things, the global warming and nuclear war. But I think there's a link between the two that thorium can help in both cases. For global warming, we replace the fossil fuel, we get safe, clean electricity, high temperature process heat. And these all reduce the problems that would cause a nuclear war. Sid was an operator of that molten salt reactor experiment at Oak Ridge in the 60s, and we are delighted to be able to learn from him today. What, what I'd like to do first is uh, thank a couple of people who, uh, at least as far as I know, were very inspirational in getting this thing going. Kirk Sorensen and my, my buddy, uh, Ms. Tonalato. What I plan to do is uh, go over some of the uh, early stuff that happened at Oak Ridge having to do with fluid fuel uh, reactors. And um, say, <clears throat> even though back then uh, we didn't have the tools and the understanding of the technology that you do now, 50 years or so later, uh, we still managed to get through it and get a reactor operating. We have a saying, if you must make a mistake, let it be a new mistake. Uh, there are some things that we learned that uh, if you guys get to be as, have as much fun as I did working on a, a reactor that, that runs and you can diddle with, uh, there's some things that you don't want to do uh, because uh, they don't work out too well. I'd like to give you some instances of things that uh, didn't work out quite as well and also things that, that I think led to a fairly successful uh, program. And then uh, at the end, I have some preaching to do. I didn't want to come all the way to Belgium just to uh, two little horns here and there. Why in the world did I move from uh, of the New York area to uh, uh, East Tennessee? Well, uh, the official reason is that uh, Alvin Weinberg's vision for peaceful uses of nuclear energy really sounded good to me. The, the other reason, of course, is I wanted to get away from the New York City traffic. Uh, <laughs> So uh, back then, uh, I, I call it uh, modest, uh, our analytical capabilities back then when I first uh, went to my first office at the ORNL, at the lab, uh, it was sort of Spartan. Um, Does anybody here know what that thing in the middle is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it, it turns out that Alvin Weinberg uh, used one of them to design the, uh, the uh, Oak Ridge reactor, the first one, the big graphite reactor back in the, in the 40s. And uh, that was, uh, let's see, this is uh, their data logger, okay? Uh, how many uh, samples per second do you get out of this? Well, you know, sort of, sort of bad. But uh, these, these two things on the right, uh, slide rule and the Marchand calculator, were really the two analy analytical tools that I had to work with back in uh, 1957. So it was sort of modest. Uh, and also back then, ORNL had a, a computer called the Oracle, digital computer, and at the time it was state of the art. It had 2,000 word memory, uh, vacuum tubes, uh, 14 kiloflops. Now that sounds pretty good, except <laughs> <laughs> uh, it took 40, Ton uh, air conditioning to keep it uh, keep it cool, and uh, they they had to tread lightly for fear that the vacuum tubes would would shake and give you the wrong answer. Uh, com <laughs> compared to today's uh, ORNL Summit system, which uh, at least when I left Oak Ridge earlier this week, it was the fastest computer in the world. Uh, the Chinese and and Oak Ridge have this thing going uh, back and forth. But it's 10 trillion times faster than the uh, Oracle. So if you're gonna get a wrong answer, you can get it a lot faster with, the, <laughs> with the, today's machine. Okay, let's see. Uh, now Alvin Weinberg uh, was a director back then, and uh, he was a, truly a visionary, a visionary guy. He, uh, 
he saw what, what was going on. He said, we really need to make reactors safer, um, more easily constructed, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'd like to do is uh, go through some of the goals that he set um, uh, early in the game, the first being uh, education for nuclear power. At, at the time I was there, there was one graduate school that I knew of, uh, North Carolina State University, that had a, a nuclear engineering program, uh, but that was it. And, um, okay, the one in the middle, uh, he wanted to reduce fossil fuel use. Uh, and the one at the end there, uh, oh yeah, it's here too. Uh, <clears throat> He had solutions in mind, uh, mainly fluid fuel reactors. So I'll go over each of these in a little bit of detail. Uh, jittery. Okay, the first thing, um, his educational um, endeavor, um, the jewel was Orsor, Oak Ridge School of Reactor Technology. Uh, it was sort of like a master's degree, but it was a lot more informal than that. Uh, one of his um, prized students was Admiral Rickover, Hyman Rickover. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the U.S. stuff, but he was the guy uh, that uh, did a lot of work with nuclear sub... He, he did the nuclear submarine business. Um, and he was trained by uh, Alvin Weinberg uh, and also inspired for uh, a lot of the other work that he uh, was responsible for in reactors. Um, one of the advantages that we had in Orsort was that we got to do our lab work on Oak Ridge National Laboratory reactors. We had about, uh, well, when I was there um, early, we had about seven or eight uh, reactors operating, so we could do all sorts of fun experiments on those reactors. Uh, one, one of the things that sort of uh, related to this conference, one of the uh, simulation problems we had for homework was called the buttermilk reactor, which was a fluid fuel reactor. And, and we'd uh, uh, study this and, and play with it by uh, using analog computers at the time. Um, this, is, this other thing that I wanted to bring up now is something that I think is a real crucial problem with our sales jobs with uh, reactors. And that is this LNT, linear no threshold effects of radiation, or in, in, in other case, lack of effects of, of radiation on, uh, on health. Um, there's, at the time, I don't think these things were understood that well back in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s. But now there's a, a very good understanding that this LNT, linear no threshold, theory is screwing up an awful lot of our sales jobs for reactors. Uh, roughly, in case you're not familiar with it, what it says is that if you get a little bit of radiation, you know, like uh, one hundredth of what you get normally, even that little bit of radiation, if you multiply it by the population exposed to that, you can get uh, cancer and deaths for not too many people, maybe only a hundred or so, but it's, it's baloney. It really is baloney, and the, the uh, biology of that has been shown. Uh, uh, papers are written on it, and we're trying to dispel the idea that this is how you worry about uh, uh, radiation. And let me show you this. The Fukushima disaster, uh, they well, of course, 15,000 people or so were killed by the, by the tsunami. But the, the health effects from the radiation are like zero compared to the number of deaths, and they estimated f about 1,500 deaths uh, due to people having to evacuate, uh, being scared to death and running in, into other people, et cetera. And this, this is something that's uh, clearly a fallacy but uh, it's not well understood, even by some of the people in the business. We, I heard a talk recently by a guy who was prominent in, the, in this business, and he was still showing us slides about uh, LNT. So that's something we need to fix. Okay, the, uh, the second category there, reduce fossil, fossil fuel use. Of course, that's, that's what we're all here for. Um, but uh, besides 
Well, back then, uh, the uh, climate change was not uh, recognized as being uh, a big problem, although I just found out recently that in as late as 1976, uh, Weinberg had written that uh, climate change problems could, could be something we need to work on in the 21st century, and sure enough. But uh, back then, uh, there was a, a clear need for uh, resource depletion and pollution concerns. And let me, okay, uh, resource depletion, and back then it was mainly a, a current concern about uh, the fossil fuels being gone forever. Uh, let's see, the, you've probably seen graphs like this. This is 1800 to the present day, and the use of coal, oil, and natural gas going up like topsy. Pretty soon that's going to be uh, a, a problem getting them. Now, the global air pollution from that, the numbers that have come out recently from the IEA, uh, these pollution problems, air pollution problems, cost six million early deaths per year globally. Now, that's that's a big number compared to the zero that we normally get from the reactors. The economic impact, I'm not sure how they calculated that, but it's the, the air pollution problems uh, are uh, account for a uh, trillion or so dollars per year. So it's a big deal if we don't go to nuclear. This is one of my, one of my favorite uh, view graphs. Uh, I think Lars likes it too. Talk about handling the pollution from, uh, from coal-fired plants. One day of a gigawatt electric coal-fired plant uses 80 rail cars full of coal. Each car, coal car, I guess the, the coal in the car, weighs 100 tons. Now, that's a lot of pollution to deal with, uh, both air pollution and solid fuel. Near Oak Ridge recently, we had a, a spill of the, uh, uh, the uh, solid fuel discharge from one of our big coal plants, and it really messed up the lake. Uh, I'm not sure where this came from, but uh, it was a TED talk. But spent fuel from one human's lifetime worth of nuclear electricity. <laughs> As a, in a Coke can. Uh, I, I didn't check that, but it, it, that's the idea, that you don't have quite as much to deal with. <clears throat> okay, uh, down at the end, um, these are uh, some of his solutions um, for uh, building uh, reactors like he wanted. Uh, safety improvements over the light water reactors, uh, of course, we don't have uh, core melt accidents because the core is supposed to be melted. Uh, higher temperature for greater efficiency. Uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite balance of plants is uh, a gas turbine, which is not a gas turbine uh, with fossil fuels, but the gas turbine is as part of the system because you can get uh, greater efficiency and, and also uh, uh, have less uh, contamination to worry about in the ba balance of plan. And back then, expand nuclear fuel resources uh, with the thorium fuel cycle. And uh, uh, Alvin Weinberg's goals from the start were to uh, develop reactors that would uh, take, care, uh, take, take advantage of the thorium fuel cycle. Okay, uh, the, the first reactor I worked on uh, was called the Homogeneous Reactor Test, the HRT, and uh, you can see it's sort of a homey look, home, homespun looking version of, it, of this guy over here uh, was the, uh, with the HRT core. The HRT was actually uh, um, not the first of this type of reactor bu uh, built and run at Oak Ridge. It was, there were several uh, predecessors to it, but uh, <clears throat> it was supposed to be the, uh, the improved version of this string of, of uh, reactors. Uh, the, uh, the fuel was uh, urinal sulfate uh, in heavy water. Uh, the idea was to demonstrate its stability, reliability, safety at all. Uh, and it was a precursor. Uh, it was the first step in Weinberg's plan to uh, have a, a thorium in the blanket region for producing U-233. So that was a... That was a good step in that area. 
This is one of my, my favorite pictures. Uh, that, that's what I used to look like when I had hair. Uh, I, and honest to God, I was in the control room of the HRT when uh, John Kennedy and his wife, President, you know, he was almost president uh, at the time. He was making his pre-presidential tours. He came to the HRT, and that's Weinberg in, in the middle there. And uh, he looked at the scale model of the HRT and said, which pipe did the $5 million go down? <laughs> he, had, he had a good sense of humor. And the, there are two things about that. One is that this reactor cost about $5 million. Uh, so, and uh, there I was behind a Sanborn recorder. And I'm not sure it actually looked like this, but I was, I was there and I heard him say that. Uh, and uh, I got a big kick out of it too, except I was wondering that if when he became president, he'd cut the funding off because he thought it was going down the drain. Okay, uh, just uh, this is an example of, of some of the ways we, we had to solve problems back then. We didn't have these fancy computers. But um, one of the things that we noticed in the uh, uh, output of the uh, uh, HRT power output, and, and we didn't have temperature readings that fast, but uh, uh, there was a very, no very noisy signal. So we were wondering where it came from. Uh, well, there was a full-scale hydraulic mock-up uh, vessel at one of, the, one of the plant buildings. And we said, well, maybe we can find out something if we use a salt solution coming in there and look at the fluctuations in the, in the conductivity and uh, see if that will give us a clue. Well, uh, it wasn't all that difficult to come across, uh, come out with uh, some uh, uh, analog circuit that would uh, uh, take the signal that we got and say, okay, if this is the output signal, uh, what would you get uh, from the fluctuations at different power levels? And so we got very good matches of the uh, uh, the, the simulation, which was uh, put together with some cobbled up analog computing equipment, and uh, and the uh, the signals we got from the HRT. Uh, <clears throat> but what it indicated was that. Uh, varying fractions of the inlet fluid, this was a downflow, would short circuit the core, and that changes the average fuel residence time. And what that is is uh, what I call an oops, because if you have some uh, fuel in there that hangs around longer than it should, that could be a problem. So. Uh, this is the rest in peace slide for the HRT. In the middle of the night, my, my boss back then got a phone call from the operator say, hey Bob, your instruments are screwing up again. And back in those days, when something went wrong, it was always the instruments that were the, the problem. <laughs> uh, but the diagnosis was that Bob said, uh, the instruments are okay. What happened, some of the uranium stayed in the car too long, uh, in the core, <laughs> not the car, too long, overheated, and plated out on the core vessel and burned a hole in it. And so the primary fluid, uh, fortunately there was a blanket region that, that caught it. So anyway, what we got is to work on the molten salt reactor experiment instead. Okay, uh, uh, the, the salt had some much better properties than the urinal sulfate going in, and uh, I'm sure uh, there's still a lot of very good work, or a, a lot of very good work done on, on uh, the molten salt itself. Uh, again, we had major goals like uh, higher temperature for efficiency, passive safety, demonstrate the reliable, predictor, predictable operation, and uh, its feasibility as a, again, like the HRT, a precursor for the thorium fuel cycle, and it was operated with uh, of the first run. We we used uh, U-235 in the fuel in the uh, primary, and uh, later uh, U-233. But it, <coughs> it it wasn't run with thorium. Every once in a while, I see uh, something on the internet saying, "Oh, this is a our thorium MSRE." Well, it was. It was part of the development of the thorium fuel cycle, but we didn't use thorium in it. 
Uh, okay, when I was a youngster, the, the part I had to play was uh, the INC instrumentation and controls design. Um, and uh, the dynamic analysis and experiments, which was the most fun, and then uh, did the operator training simulator. Um, the, well, I'll get into the dynamic stuff later. Okay, um, you may have seen this picture of the uh, MSRE air-cooled radiator. Um, just to let people know that these things are hot, these high temperature reactors are hot, so you, you see this red glow. Now the, the gas cooled reactors, uh, I, I worked after the MSRE, I worked on uh, high temperature gas cooled reactors for about 45 years, uh, just in passing. Uh, <laughs> and those are a lot hotter uh, than this, uh, this thing. This was about, uh, well, all, there's another thing about the MSRE, all its temperatures were in Fahrenheit. So I, th I thought that might bother people. <laughs> this is Europe, you know. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, that was, uh, it was, oh, another thing that's I guess not commonly known is that uh, this uh, power, uh, rated power was eight megawatts instead of 10 megawatts like we designed it originally. Uh, the, uh, the fellow that uh, designed, that calculated the heat transfer in the radiator was a very good golfer. <laughs> maybe, maybe, what do I do for the joke? Do I do a dance or something? <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> MSRE dynamics. Well, there's one thing about this design, and, and probably it could be true of a lot of, uh, a lot of designs, uh, molten salt type designs. Uh, the, the dynamic characteristics change markedly uh, from low power to, to high power and in between. So uh, control systems have to be able to adapt to that. And before, um, before the reactor was built, uh, there was some concern about the, uh, the stability and uh, low power oscillations maybe. And uh, so what it did, uh, that, that concern provided funding for the results of the uh, of the work, uh, this is the end of the story. Uh, the dynamics were very well understood over a full range of power, and the inherent safety features were confirmed. And I'll give you some examples of this. One of the biggest things was the MSRE was a lot of fun. My, my buddy Tom Curlin and I got to uh, design and run a whole bunch of experiments having to do with the stability of the um, of the thing, and uh, <clears throat> we used this thing called, the, for frequency response testing, we, we called this thing a pseudo-random binary sequences, the PRVS, for rod jog experiments. What you can do is you can learn a whole lot about the uh, dynamics of a plant using frequency response techniques that you can't making steady state uh, uh, measurements. And so, uh, since the dynamics were of a concern to this thing, uh, we used uh, a number of different things for, uh, for this. Now, this PRBS control rod jog, what you do, you run the rod in and out a little bit to get your input signal, and these signals are strong signals at various frequencies, and you know what the frequencies are, so uh, any noise that is in the signal that might uh, contaminate your, your results, it goes away if you're just looking at these exact frequencies. And this is a very efficient way of doing the, the tests. And this is one of my, my favorite things here. This shows the period of oscillation from a period of uh, one minute uh, in the oscillation or uh, up to a period of uh, 25 minutes at the low powers. This is power level from uh, and it's not, maybe not clear that it's from a log scale from 0.02 to 10 megawatts. And, and what, <clears throat> what we found was it, as the power increases, the oscillations are more damped and occur at higher frequencies. Uh, and you, uh, I guarantee you the, uh, the calculated curve 
was uh, done four years before the measurement, so we didn't have to tweak it. And I might say this is this is the best match of experimental data, better than any of the ones I did in my 45 years of uh, gas reactors. <laughs> this is a little bit for geeks, but this has to do with the, the stability and the fact that we were able to take all this data comparing the theoretical and the, and the calculated for different power levels. I won't get into that, but if anybody wants to discuss it with me afterwards, I'll, I'll, I'll give them a, a run as to why the power oscillated at near zero power and didn't later. I'd be available with a cup of coffee afterwards if you want to get more details on that. Okay, uh, now the, the PRBS tests had had some excitement here and there. Uh, one dark and stormy night, we were running tests at power and everything was, was going fine. The rod jogger, the thing that, that runs the, the control rod up and down to vary the power, um, uh, stuck in the withdrawn position. And what that means is the power goes up and the power went up and it kept going up and up uh, to its highest ever, uh, above the, uh, the maximum that we had assigned for the thing. But uh, all by itself, this is without the control system running, it decreased uh, to normal on its own. So Tom Curlin and I recorded the event, went home, and uh, next day Dick Engel said, you don't need to file an incident report. That's how things were in the olden days. <laughs> And that was, <clears throat> that was one of the reasons these were fun. Okay, uh, yeah, um, y you, can, you can solve some problems without spending a whole lot of money, or at least back then, then you could. Uh, I was a, an analog computer nut for a, a, quite a while, and uh, this thing in, over here, uh, Kirk uh, took some better pictures of this, but I, I never, I don't think you could find them. Anyway, uh, this is called a TR-10 analog computer. And what I did is, is uh, simulate the, uh, the dynamics, uh, both for the startup from like zero power all the way up to full power and had the outputs of the computer plugged into the, the back of the actual uh, reactor control panel. Uh, and this was good for uh, pre-operation operator training. Uh, now, once, once the, uh, the uh, reactor itself was tied into the control, uh, control panel, they didn't want me to unscrew everything and plug this analog computer back in for a, a very good reason. But uh, so this, this is how uh, we, we uh, trained operators um, for the initial operation on U-235. And uh, I'm sure it was the cheapest ever because it was only three or four weeks of my time and I was underpaid at the time. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, uh, this is one of these things uh, where, uh, I think the, the title of this talk was changed to Lessons uh, from MSRE. Anyway, these, these are lessons and, and uh, I listed things that I thought were contributors, things that were contributing to the success of the program. As it, uh, the project was entirely at ORNL. Well, we did buy some commercial equipment, but the the whole process was done at one place at the lab, and this allowed for very close cooperation between the disciplines. This is something that doesn't happen a lot, at least in the U.S., because uh, we have a whole bunch of laboratories, and if a project comes up, uh, oh, each little lab has to have its part. Well, if you want to have close collaboration and a successful program that's really very complicated, you can do a whole lot better if everybody's speaking to each other without having to travel to Idaho, for example. Uh, yeah. Now, if there are any INEO guys, I'm, I didn't mean that as an insult. <laughs> uh, we had 
inspirational leadership and management, uh, mainly because of Alvin Weinberg, but about the other people that we had running the shop. Everybody was really dedicated to this, this process. Um, and the, the areas where uh, it was really crucial were in the nuclear chemical type guys and the maintenance engineers. Uh, I think probably a lot of you have seen pictures of the MSRE. It, it looks like a jungle down there. And these maintenance guys figured out ways of getting down access to this and that and fixing it and coming back up. It was absolutely extraordinary what those guys could do. And, and I think for, um, uh, for a, a thorium fuel cycle, uh, you're going to have uh, maintenance problems that are probably more challenging because of the high radiation fields you get from uh, pro protactinium and, and its daughters and all. Uh, okay, the other thing, we were able to do a lot of experiments. Uh, I mentioned, I think, how easy it was for us to, to run experiments and get data. And if, if you have that kind of flexibility, you can understand your process quite well. Uh, and we had very good, consistent, adequate funding, at least until the uh, LMFBR people came and took all our money. <laughs> uh, and, and that was fun because uh, uh, later on, when I, on projects I worked with, uh, just about everybody that worked on it had to go to Washington and explain what you were doing to, to people, as opposed to staying home and working. And everybody enjoyed it. Okay, problems. Um, the unexpected corrosion problems. I, I got some feedback uh, from Andrea about uh, the corrosion being a big problem. Well, there was some corrosion, but it really wasn't discovered until the, the thing shut down. It was uh, tellurium cracking, I'm not a I'm not a materials guy, but it was something that uh, for at least that reactor um, would be resolved by uh, adjusting the the chemistry. Now, when when you guys have a, a thorium cycle machine, um, <clears throat> there could be corrosion from all the extra soup that's in the mix that needs to be worked out with the materials, but. I, I understand uh, in Europe there's a lot of really good materials work. We have uh, an excellent materials uh, division at, at the lab that um, I, I think between the two of you and others, uh, the materials problems, they might be challenging, but they're certainly uh, uh, fixable, according to my, my experts. Um, Okay, well that funding, funding cut was another problem. Um, another problem we had with the, uh, with the MSRE during shutdown, after it was shut down, uh, we put in for uh, uh, funding to take care of the, of the stuff that was left. And uh, the AEC said, uh, well, we don't have money for that. And after that stuff sat around for a while, it, it got to be a real problem and the cleanup for that uh, cost more than the reactor. So when you mothball a reactor, make sure it's done right. A little more on Alvin Weinberg. He was what I'd call a Renaissance man as well as a scientist and lab director. Glenn Seaborg was our head of our AEC at the time and he was there when, at least when we started up on U-233. This is one of our favorite pictures of him. He's looking at a strip chart recorder with 6,000 full power hours on it. He lived with his table here. And uh, Dick Engel, one of my buddies, he was my, my project boss at the MSRE. There he is showing Glenn how to run the reactor. Alvin was a pianist, a good pianist. He'd do uh, concerts at our local coffee concert venues. Uh, a fair tennis player. It was amazing. Uh, he wasn't all that good, but he got to beat an awful lot of people that uh, would, was a surprise that he would win matches uh, with his level of competence. Uh, and uh, division information readings. 
uh, I called him a terror at that. When we had, when our division and everybody's division had an information meeting, Alvin would sit down in the front row and ask questions. And you jolly well better have the answer or at least understand what was going on or he'd fry you. Pause. Observations. Technology would have appeared to be magic back in the 1950s. If somebody in the 1950s uh, took out their smartphone and started talking to people in South Korea, uh, you'd, you'd say, that's magic. Well, technologies of the 2060s, for you young folks, is going to be magic to you. So looking ahead uh, can be an interesting thing. Uh, there's been some neat books about that. Okay, uh, hopeful <laughs> conclusions. Uh, with today's tools, we should be much better equipped to solve molten salt problems than we were in MSRE days. You got a lot more basic physics, chemistry, <laughs> materials, information than we had back then. A lot of the stuff we were flying blind, blind on. Um, so, and, and the computers are a little, little bit better, <laughs> as I noted. So. All right, uh, that's, that's pretty much what happened back then. Um, but let's look a little bit into the future and uh, see what we need to do about it. And uh, I, I've been to a number of uh, talks recently about climate change and how it works and what the projections are. And, and one of the things they, they seem to go on is if we don't do anything to correct the situa situation, the carbon dioxide, et cetera, releases, we're going to have a lot of trouble with the CO2 levels going up and all sorts of crap happening from that. And, and uh, so th the guy th was talking about that as the worst case. And then I said, well, you know, I've, I've seen um, projections uh, for India and China. This is one for India, where even though the uh, even though India is planning a, a, a good nuclear program, the, uh, the fossil use would be go up by a factor of four by 2050. So uh, business as usual is not only uh, not a, uh, uh, let's say, a bad thing to have to contemplate, you've got to deal with uh, fossil use increasing considerably, and, and this is, I have stuff with China too, and it's uh, not good. The, there's another thing that, that people tend to talk about with, uh, oh, the population is going to increase, so we're going to have more uh, concern about use of energy um, by uh, the fact that there are more people to deal with. Uh, but there's this other factor that uh, the developed countries are only a fifth or so of the world population, and the developing countries are quickly wanting more and more energy because their standard of living goes up. So even without an increase in population, you're going to have to deal with a lot more energy demand. Here's a, a rough thing, and a lot of you guys know more about these, these things, especially with uh, the Radway storage. But uh, these are some of the reasons that uh, high temperature uh, systems with thorium are keys to success. The efficiency for uh, high temperature machines, uh, this is something that I dealt with a lot with the, the gas coal reactors. Um, if you have a higher efficiency of, let's say, uh, close to 50% for electricity generation versus uh, 30 or 30. 3% for light water reactors, you need to use a whole lot less fuel. Uh, and the waste heat, the heat reject that you're dealing with is a factor of two less with the higher efficiency. Um, and of course, less waste to deal with per um, megawatt hour of electricity. And this, this brings me to my, my favorite uh, balance of plant, which is a, a gas turbine balance of plant, which you can do with high temperature machines. Uh, they work well with solar and wind. Uh, this is something, my, my son is a solar electric <coughs> engineer running all around the world, and uh, I've had nice talks with him. 
uh, I don't argue with him. He might support me in my old age, but uh, it, it, really, it, it really is something that utilities have to deal with. If, if a, uh, a significant fraction of your power is generated by wind and solar, what you get is something that looks like this. this uh, there's a, a website by a Danish guy, P.F. Bach, that has data on, on power generation uh, by all sorts of European countries. And uh, this, one is, this particular one is a plot from wind and power output uh, in Germany for uh, three months in 2012. And you see what you get from uh, the, uh, the PV is uh, the, the yellowish ones and the, uh, the green is, is the wind. So this, this is what um, the, the green power thing, uh, supply thing looks like. And this is what the utilities have to deal with. Now, uh, these are some uh, things, this is still that German thing, but just three days in July and three days in January, what the actual load is that the utility has to cope with, has to supply. Uh, and this is uh, the, the photovoltaics for um, the first three days in January and the first three days in July. And you see, obviously, the, the sun doesn't shine as much, at least in that part of, in, in, this is total Germany. So w what you have for your utility, they, they have great com uh, contributions in the summer, but not much. And, and it varies all over the lot. Now, the, the point <clears throat> that I wanted to make is that for the gas turbine balance of plant, uh, you can get very quick, efficient response to the power uh, by uh, bypassing or changing the, uh, the, the pressure, the inventory in the primary system. So if you, were, if you had a machine that, that could handle all these differences in, in power demand, you do well in Germany. What they, what I heard they do mainly uh, to deal with it, they have uh, fossil gas yes, turbine plants sitting there waiting, and when the time comes, we gotta have power, more power, less power, and it's very inefficient and costly. Okay, uh, another another point. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but the the point is that. High temperature reactors can supply process heat for the process heat industries. And in the US, the process heat energy use is about the same as what's spent on electricity production. So if you could use your high temperature uh, machine output for process heat, you're taking away another huge uh, outfit that uh, needs, uh, in this case, it, it uses fossil energy. Okay, uh, now what do we do to ramp up the nuclear power plant? Uh, and this, this one is besides funding. Uh, the next slide is, is not, as, not as happy. <laughs> There's some basic understanding issues, I think. One is cost comparisons with alternatives. I hear a lot, oh, that, that reactor well, some of them really do, <laughs> but that reactor costs way too much. Uh, we can we can get a, a lot cheaper with uh, gas turbines. Okay, but if you factor in the external costs, like uh, the costs that you'll be paying for climate change and pollution, and I added war, and we'll get to that, uh, the, the cost comparisons aren't that favorable to these other systems. Uh, Radiation health effects, the LNT Fukushima, I went into that. That's a, that's a huge factor. Every time you have a Fukushima, the, uh, our business is set back a decade or more. People need to know more about these uh, spent fuel storage improvements that you get with the thorium cycle. And I think that's one of the main reasons, as I understand, that, that uh, Europe is... is uh, uh, <clears throat> That's one of the favorable points about thorium fuel. Uh, risk education, understand passive safety advantages. I think uh, a lot of people just don't understand risk. They'll, they'll do some really stupid things 
Uh, oh, one minute? Okay. Uh, technical challenges. Um, licensing is a problem. Uh, when I dealt with the, uh, I, I dealt with the licensing people for my gas cool reactor stuff, they, they just have a hard time handling that. Um, conversion of thorium to U-233, there's, uh, it, it'll be a challenge dealing with the protactinium, U-232 and high gamma doses. And, but I think you guys can handle that with work. Okay, this is about my last one. Uh, one of our big problems is that we have the uh, military industrial complex with their political power in the U.S. Probably, I don't know, it's not as bad in Europe, I'm sure. And the green lobbies. Um, we need to get big time funding for these things if we're going to do anything. The, uh, the folks at, uh, at my workshop earlier this month, they had great stuff going on. But the funding levels were here and there. To, to get something really going in time to save our behinds, we're going to have to get big money. And I think if people understand the, the reasons that we're doing this is to, you know, like Miriam said, save the planet. We got to get busy. Uh, one example, um, I've used others, but this one, the, our 2018 military budget increase was $60 billion. Uh, if we only, if we could wangle from this complex 10% of that, think of what a heck of a job we could do developing and building these things. This, this, this next one, I might want to run over another minute. Uh, we got to save the planet. And what I, I heard a, a, a talk by Noam Chomsky, I don't know if you know him, but he's a, a favorite, one of my favorite philosophy types. Uh, the planet is, in, or the, at least human habitation on the planet, is really threatened by two major things, the global warming and nuclear war. But I think there's a link between the two that uh, uh, our thorium business can, can help in both cases. Uh, for global warming, we replace the fossil fuel, we get safe, clean electricity, high temperature process heat. And these all, re, uh, all reduce the, the problems that would cause a nuclear war. Uh, this Operation Iraqi, Liberate, uh, Iraqi Liberation, uh, acronym is OIL, uh, we can avoid energy and water wars. Uh, in Miriam's film, the abundance of thorium is great. You don't have to invade places to get your fuel. Uh, if you reduce the flooding, fires, crop failures, all that stuff that comes with global warming, it destabilizes and displaces populations. And in a chaotic situ uh, situation, someone might hit the red button. Sorry, I don't want to do that. Okay, we have a problem. Uh, Weinberg's uh, writings back in 1967 have to do with tackling complex problems. Basic research at places like the lab lies in the interdisciplinary composition of their staffs. Good people from diverse fields working together can make more scientific discoveries than are de that are denied geniuses working in isolation. In other words, cooperate guys. Now for applied research, the jobs that we have undertaking at ORNL, this is 1967, the breeder reactor, civil defense, desalination, uh, agro-industrial complex as an instrument for development of the world's hungry nations. These involve numerous technologies and viewpoints, some from natural sciences, uh, some from social sciences and political affairs. The key to successful attacks is the existence of coherent teams working together aggressively and with enthusiasm. And good luck, guys.